So I've had the Amex Platinum, the Chase Sapphire Turf, as well as the Capital One Venture X for multiple years now. And if you ask me, if you could only choose one of them, which one do you choose? In this video, I'll be breaking down the factual reasoning behind each of these cards of what makes them the right choice for the general person, as well as the right decision based on you, your spending profile, your travel lifestyle, and all these other type of reasonings. And at the end, I'll share my personal reasoning where, yeah, today I have all three of them, but if I could only pick one, which one would I choose? So with that, let's get straight into it. These three cards are the most popular in the whole US credit card market and they're super famous for their super high annual fees. They're $395, $550, and 695 bucks. They're touted to be the most popular premium travel credit cards, and how we'll do this is go over the commonalities between these three cards, because there's quite a few, and at the same time, there's a lot of unique selling points on a card-by-card -card basis. Starting off, what these cards look like on a day-to-day -day basis, the Amex Platinum, for example, it gives us 5x points per each and every dollar spent on flights when we book directly with the airline, as well as on amextravel.com. When it comes to hotel bookings, we also get 5x points per dollar spent if we book them specifically through that same amextravel.com. And in general, you're gonna get one point per dollar spent everywhere else. When it comes to the Amex Platinum's 5x on those flights, it's capped at $500,000 in spend each year. And these type of what seems minor yet significant details, I'll sprinkle them throughout the video. With only those categories being the multiplier, it's not really the strongest daily driver card where when you're spending on dining or grocery or gas, you're basically getting that one X per dollar spent. With Amex, they're known as membership rewards points. With Chase, they're known as ultimate rewards points. And for Capital One, we'll just call them miles. We'll get into the value of exactly what these points are worth super shortly here. At the same time, the beauty about all these cards is that the currencies that they earn, they can be transferred directly to transfer partners, such as airlines and hotels. In English, that basically means, hey, I got this many points. I don't need to redeem that to cash back and then use that cash for travel. You can directly just redeem it with said partner. On screen right now is the different ways in which you can redeem, whether they're membership rewards points or points that we're earning through the other two cards. The value we receive from redeeming these points with certain methods, there is some nuance, which I'll cover in our analysis section towards the end of the video. With the Capital One Venture X or the Chase Sapphire Reserve, both of these cards have their own internal travel portal. Imagine booking through Expedia.com, Priceline, Booking.com, essentially an online travel agency. It's essentially that, but just internal to your credit card account. So you can log into CapitalOne.com or Chase.com and then access your credit card account and then book flights through that internal portal. The crazy thing here is that there's actually a very high multiplier for each and every dollar spent when you're booking travel through these portals. With the Capital One Venture X, we're looking at 10X miles per dollar spent on hotels as well as rental cars. And when it comes to booking flights, we get 5X miles per dollar spent and 5X miles for each and every dollar spent on vacation rentals. On the Chase Ultimate Rewards portal, we're looking at that same 10X on rental cars as well as hotels, and 5X per dollar spent on flights. Specific to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, we also get 10X per dollar spent on a feature known as Chase Dining. The restaurants slash merchants that are offered through this program, they're not gonna be your McDonald's or Burger King kind of level. They're gonna be a little more posh, we could say. It's essentially a marketing slash user acquisition method for restaurants that are looking for a certain type of client clientele or just to increase their book of business. Outside of Chase Dining, on just general restaurant slash takeout spend, we're looking at 3x points per dollar spent when we're spending with the Chase Sapphire Reserve. And on the same page as how the Amex Platinum earns 1x points on each and every dollar spent on miscellaneous spend, same thing with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, we get 1x everywhere. With the Capital One Venture X, we're looking at 2x miles earned on each and every dollar spent outside of those internal portal categories. So whatever you're spending on, gas, groceries, dining, what have you, you're getting 2X miles per dollar spent. The main selling point of these cards is exactly how they're advertised. They're premium travel cards. In other words, the benefits that come with them is really where the true value is at. And right before that, I will say that the earn rate, it's pretty decent just based on your spend profile. So based on where you're spending, it could make a lot of sense or maybe not a lot of sense. And so on the flip side of that, I will say the fact that they're metal cards, that's cool. Some people, if that's really what you're looking for, 
there's honestly better no annual fee metal cards that look even more sleek that you could consider. And the intro offers, which all of these cards have huge intro kind of stellar bonuses, which can provide thousands of dollars of value. Let me go over them really quick and we'll come right back to the benefits. At the current time of recording, the Amex Platinums bonus goes all the way up to 175,000 membership reward points. It says up to because basically it's going to be a variable type of situation in terms of the offer that's going to be extended to you based on a multitude of factors. A super solid offer would be 125,000 points in my opinion where that can be, let's say 150, or if they wanna give you the 175 maximum up to intro offer, then that's a great opportunity to seize. The reason I say that is because these bonuses, they're once in a lifetime when it comes to American Express. So if you take, let's say that 175K offer and tomorrow, or let's just say a year from now, casually, let's say it's around that 125 to 150 for most folks, and hey, today you got 175,000 points as an offer, then that's something you really may wanna consider. The value of these points, it's really gonna come down to the individual, and if you redeem, let's say for pure cash, that's basically the worst way you could redeem Amex points. We're looking at essentially 0.6 cents per point times, let's just say we have that solid offer of 125,000 points, then in dollars, it's basically this much. The 750 bucks you may get as a cash equivalent in terms of the bonus, it basically covers the annual fee in year one of that 695 with Amex Platinum, but I wouldn't say that's the true focus. Typically, you can get a better value than let's just say one penny per point. So 125K points at one penny is 1,250 bucks. And in general, if you're taking business or first class flights, you can definitely get extreme value. But the true question with any redemption is, would you really spend the cash for let's say a $20,000 flight that you can get for 100,000 points? The true question is, well, would you have spent the 20 grand or let's say, hey, would you have spent maybe two grand so that 100,000 points, if you were willing to spend $2,000, then that true value is really like two pennies per point. With the same logic, if it's a domestic flight redemption or luxurious hotel type of equivalent, then that 125K points at two cents per point would then be worth $2,500 in cash value. When I first got the Amex Platinum, the max offer at the time was 100,000 points. And me not knowing as much as I needed to know about everything credit cards, points, and miles, which is the same reason of why I create these type of videos, I accepted an offer of 60,000 points. That was still a lot of value, but I could have done that much better. And with this once in a lifetime kind of language, even let's say later, like 20 years from now, I'm just making it up. Let's say the sign up bonus was a million points, right? It doesn't matter. The point is whether I signed up at 60,000 points, some guy, you know, 20 years before me signed up for an offer for 30,000 points and maybe that was a big deal back then, right? It's all just relative. So the point is, if you have a use case or some type of logic of why you wanna apply, whether it's Amex Platinum or otherwise, then all that logical type of reasoning goes into that decision making. There's also additional reasoning of, hey, you know, do you apply for the Amex Platinum first or what about other cards offered through Amex's portfolio? I'll get into that later on in the video. And right before we move on to the Capital and Venture X, the up to 175K offer, it's for $8,000 in spend within the first six months. This is important to know because there's gonna be different point offers for different amounts of spend within different time frames, and it just depends on the card, the issuer, the bank, and just their strategy basically from the banks. In other words, when I got my 60K offer, it wasn't for 8K in six months, it was for five grand in three months. That timing could mean all the difference for someone choosing one card over the other. And so on that same train, with the Capital Venture X, we're looking at 75,000 Capital Venture miles after 4K in spend in the first three months. With American Express points, there's amextravel.com. With Capital One, they have their internal travel portal. And so in both cases, the points can be redeemed at one penny per point through these portals. And if we use those miles to transfer to partners, then it's gonna depend on a case-by-case -case basis. So if you say two cents per point, which I'll typically use in these type of scenarios, then you're looking at up to 1500 bucks in value. And before moving on to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, when I got the Venture X, I got it on the first day it came out and it was 100,000 points after 10K in spend in the first six months to my memory. And the reason that matters is because after that, they never had basically the 100K offer. It's pretty much been at that 75K ever since the product launched. Basically, I wouldn't say wait around for that 100K offer again, do what you gotta do. Coming to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, their points are different from how Amex's works and Capital One. You can redeem these points earned with pure cash back at one penny per point. This means if we have 100,000 points, then with Amex, that'd be 600 bucks in cash. 
with Capital One, if you redeem for cash, you basically get 0.5 cents per point, which is even worse than Amex. So 100,000 would be just 500 bucks in cash back with the Capital One Venture X. But with Chase, if you have 100,000 points, you could literally have $1,000 in pure cold hard cash. The cool part about Chase points is that outside of having a very strong rate for cash back, with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, there's a special benefit where you can redeem the points on that same Chase internal travel portal and you won't get just one penny a point like you would get on the travel portals with Capital One and Amex, you'd actually get one and a half cents per point. So 100,000 points, instead of it being a thousand bucks in cash back, it'd be up to $1,500 in travel. And not up to, it's like fixed. 100,000, 1,500 bucks. A million points, $15,000, etc. And right before we move on to the Chase Sapphire Reserve's bonus details, I will say, that miles and points can stretch really far in terms of value. With one quick example being that we basically took one-way flights nonstop Atlanta to Paris on Air France slash KLM for 15,000 miles each way. And if that flight, let's say it's 750 bucks cash, just at the peak of when we were trying to travel during summer, that's basically saying five cents per point. So in other words, if you're getting, let's say, three times points per dollar spent with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, then having 15 cents per point really means that each of those points earned are worth five pennies. So it's like 15% essentially back per dollar spent for travel. The Chase Sapphire Reserve's bonus currently is 60,000 points after 4K in spend in the first three months. It's been 80,000 points at a certain time. It's also been 50,000 points. And when I first got the card, it was 100,000 points. The point is, after it was at 100 at that max level, it's never really seen 100 again, which was just like a publicly easily available offer. And right before moving on to the benefits section, I've had a question on my mind that has been there not just of recent, but for some time. And I wanna share this question with you because it directly impacts the talk we're having here today. And it's a question of understanding that, hey, Chase points, they're worth one penny per point that we have. So if we have 100,000 points, that's 1,000 bucks. If we have a million points, that's $10,000. And so my question to you is, would you rather prefer 5 million points or $50,000 cash? And that's the same logic as 10 mil points versus 100K cash. The reason this is important is with Chase, one fine day, if you're hoarding points or saving for a big redemption, but you really need like cash or you use it as an emergency fund, everyone's different then that's a real use case slash scenario, which could be really vital and useful when you need it, unlike with Amex or Capital One. So just some food for thought, but that is going to be the benefit. There's a lot that's going to be going on here. So starting off with the commonalities, all three of these cards have no foreign transaction fees. So when we spend abroad, there's no extra fees that are incurred. All you got to do is spend in that country's currency. So if we're in Poland and we're spending Zlotys, then basically make sure you're not converting when you swipe your card or tap or insert the chip. It will ask you, hey, do you want to convert to USD and then pay? Don't do that and just pay in the local currency and that foreign exchange fee slash basically no foreign transaction fees will come into effect. Simultaneously, all these three cards offer a way for us to get through airport security even faster. Whether we call it Global Entry, Nexus, TSA PreCheck, basically the very high level difference is let's say you're traveling to Canada more often, maybe you prefer Nexus. If you're 100% domestic to America and always traveling, TSA PreCheck sounds and makes perfect sense. The thing is with Global Entry, you get TSA PreCheck a part of it. So you might as well get that instead. From there, irrespective of which card we choose, we get the same level of airport lounge access at minimum, where each of these cards have their own kind of special lounges and accesses, which I'll get to in a sec. But it's a program known as Priority Pass. Currently, they have 1,300 plus lounges worldwide. And over the years, they've been expanding their network and reach. So in general, there'll be more as time progresses. Now it's gonna get kind of interesting where there's multiple credits for each of these cards and I'll give you what you need to know about them before moving on to our next portion. The Chase Sapphire Reserve has an annual fee of $550. And the credits that it comes with, the first one is a $300 super flexible travel credit. Whether you're spending on parking, paying tolls, taking an Uber or a Lyft, in general, the $300 travel credit can be used for a myriad of reasons just like this. Essentially, if you take 550 minus 300, you basically net out at 250 bucks we're still paying for this card, but there are other benefits that come with it. The ones I'm about to mention, as well as put on screen, they do change constantly and consistently 
year over year or every couple of years. So definitely do your own due diligence, go onto the Chase Sapphire Reserve site and take a look for yourself. The big thing to know here is that if you basically have zero use case to use any of these services, unless you go supremely out of your way, then maybe this card really is not gonna make sense for you unless you're spending that much on it or have some other type of use case from a different benefit that it has to offer. You have monthly DoorDash credits, which before this, it was through a merchant known as Instacart. And in general, they had another merchant known as GoPuff. And so in general, these really do change over time. We have an increased multiplier when we're spending with Peloton. At the same time, when we're booking with the collection known as The Edit through Chase, essentially, more kind of refined hotels. In other words, bluntly put, a little more expensive, definitely. It comes with your perks such as daily breakfast for two, $100 on property credit and items like this. And so these type of special benefits, if you just book you know, directly cash, if that's your style, then you can basically have a better slash holistic advantage just by having the Chase Sapphire Reserve and doing the same activities. There's also Lyft Pink, which is Lyft's membership program, similar to Uber One. And with it, you'll get a little cheaper rate, you know, maybe waiting less for each and every ride you take, sometimes some complimentary upgrades, and they have other features and benefits. And if it makes sense, there's discounted rates on annual memberships in the longer term. And in general, there's even more benefits with the Chase Sapphire Reserve. It's just the real sheer fact that they do change every so often, whether it's every year, two years, is the big thing that it's like, okay, this is great, but if you really aren't paying attention, that's one big thing with this card, I will say, that it's not like, hey, five years ago, there was a specific credit and it's still kind of there. Other than that $300 flexible travel credit, a lot of these other ones, they've been changing. With the Capital One Venture X, the annual fee is $395, and it's renowned for folks to say, wait a second, they're paying me $5 to keep this card. The reason this is, is they give you a $300 travel credit, which unlike the Chase one, you can only redeem it through Capital One's travel portal. And although that sounds pretty straightforward, equivalently if you're booking flights or hotels with that same money, the issue is on the portal, sometimes the fees slash amount of money just for a certain type of purchase, it could be a little higher than when you compare maybe directly on the website for said airline or hotel, or even like Expedia.com, for example. When we compare with the same $300 Chase Sapphire Reserve travel credit, we could go on Expedia, make some purchases, and that actually counts against that credit, which that Expedia flight may be cheaper than going and booking the same flight on Capital One's travel portal. Yet all else equal, let's say we get a full $300 in value, then that $395 minus $300 leaves us with $95. Bucks. And another benefit of the Capital One Venture X is that each and every account anniversary, we get 10,000 miles. Converting this to cash, 10,000 miles, it's 50 bucks. On the portal though, at one penny per point of value that we get for booking travel on that portal, it's basically a hundred bucks. And so 300 plus a hundred is 400 bucks back to us for spending $395 in regards to that annual fee. Apart from the minutia of details, in general, both of the credits are really easy to use. In other words, with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, that 300 buck travel credit, it does trigger very seamlessly slash easily. So it's not like, oh, I spent on parking and it's not gonna work. Usually it works most times. And with the Capital and Venture X, they literally say, hey, just spend on the portal and you'll get that money back. And so it's very straightforward in that regard as well. Now coming to the behemoth, the Amex Platinum, $695. It gets advertised as, hey, we offer like $1,400 plus in credits. And whether all of them are useful or not, this is the majority of what they have to offer. And there's even more that I'm probably just not gonna get to. The first is Walmart Plus. And before you say, hey, I don't shop at Walmart or you know, I wouldn't even use that, the use case I've personally got is that Sam's Club, it's owned by Walmart. And so getting gas at Sam's Club, you, I can't get it if I don't have a Sam's Club membership. And so I have a Costco membership, but not at Sam's Club. So I can get their preferred gas pricing when I'm just out and about because with the Walmart Plus app, you just scan and then you're able to access Sam's Club's gas. On a similar car related subject, you have $200 bucks to Uber and this is for Uber rides or as well as Uber Eats for delivery. And so this 200 bucks in a year is distributed as 15 bucks each and every month and 35 bucks in the month of December. From there, we get 100 bucks to Saks Fifth Avenue and it's distributed as 50 bucks in the first six months of the year and 50 bucks again in the second half. And if you don't actually shop there, let's say on the regular at Saks, 
then I also look at this 50 bucks as a way to get you kind of in the door. And so I think that it basically was the marketing play of, okay, folks that aren't aware of the brand or maybe not willing to spend, at least they have a reason to consider them. And the folks that normally shop there, that's actually great because you're just getting a little discount, let's say, on your next purchase, just based on the time of the year. Saks Fifth Avenue is understood to offer more of your luxury brands. And similarly, within the gym realm, there's Equinox, which maybe it's not your real Planet Fitness or LA Fitness. It's a lot better than that, a lot more amenities, features, all the things. And so you get 300 bucks to Equinox, as well as SoulCycle for specific credits to be used in a specific way. But if you're already going to Equinox, for example, then the Amex Platinum, it basically suits that individual's profile. On the flight side, you get a $200 airline credit, where the caveat being you gotta pick one specific airline. And for incidental fees, such as let's say baggage or seat selection, basically that credit can go towards those type of purchases. For me specifically, I used to be Spirit Airlines Gold status, and with gold status, you actually get free seat selection, free bags. And if you know Spirit or Frontier, that is not the case in general. And so when I wasn't gold anymore, the $200 airline credit was basically a way for me to understand that, okay, I knew I had these Spirit you know, expenses coming up and you can see it in my face, I, I hate paying extra, but the $200 airline credits, like I'm prepaying for something I would have, you know, unfortunately, you know, had to spend in general. On a super similar note to the global entry, TSA pre-check Nexus topic, we also get access to clear. If you've been to the airport and you've seen these kind of kiosk type of stands, you basically can scan your retinas or scan your fingerprints. And basically there's a quicker, faster line to get within airport security to your endpoint that much faster. The whole campaign with Clear is essentially not just within airports, but hey, you know, if there's Clear stands at, let's say, a stadium or somewhere else where people have to wait a really long time, it's basically like a fast pass type of benefit in life that isn't limited to just to airports, but, you know, expect it to be available in all these other type of use cases across America and maybe the world. And while we're still in the airport, the Amex Platinum comes with Centurion Lounge access, which is essentially Amex's network of proprietary lounges where they're understood and known to be the cream of the crop. At the same time, there are amazing business and first class Apple lounges in other parts of the world. But I personally have not been to an Amex lounge in Asia where I hear that's next level, but I can confidently say that Amex insurance lounges are better outside of just the number and sheer traffic within them with how many people have platinum cards and how many people are in there. It's just gonna be better than the priority pass network of airport lounges. On the hotel side, we get status just by having the Amex platinum and we get Marriott gold as well as Hilton gold. Is it the top tier status? No. Is it the least? Not at all. And so in many cases, in my personal experience, it has helped me more than not. It's not just some BS, you know, status that's given to you that has no value. It really is like, all right, you know, you're, you're solid. You're at goal level. It's not, let's say, you know, platinum or diamond. There's something known as fine hotels and resorts. And you get $200 to book certain hotels through this internal kind of portal slash program that Amex has to offer to us. For the Amex Platinum, we also have something known as the hotel collection which is more similar to that $100 property credit, daily breakfast for two that we were mentioning with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, as well as Capital One has something similar where it's known as their premier collection. In short, the programs are somewhat similar with Amex's fine hotels and resort program being really the best of all of these options. I've lost natural sunlight from the outside, so we're just gonna get straight into the analysis section here. I will say that choosing one of these cards as long as the annual fees outweigh the benefits, the credits, the earn rate, and all the you know intro offer, all that equation, right? If it makes sense for you, then that already you have your answer. That each of these cards, or maybe two out of three, or maybe just the one makes sense, then you got your answer. In a vacuum, all of these cards are actually pretty nice. They're they're pretty good, as long as you're able to get value from it. And what I will say is that within each of these programs, Chase, Amex, Capital One, there are ways to get even more value by having a combination of cards within their portfolios. There are certain duos and trifectas in the game. So with Capital One, if you have the Venture X, where from a net annual fee perspective, as long as you're getting that $300 travel credit, those 10,000 miles are worth at least 100 bucks to you, you're getting 400 for paying 395. And with that understanding, there's another card known as the Capital One Saver One, where you're getting 3% on dining as well as groceries. The cool thing is, is that you can combine 
what you earned with the Saver 1 with the Venture X. So essentially that 3% cash back is essentially 3x miles per dollar spent on those categories. And the Saver 1 has no annual fee. So essentially having both of these cards means that you have essentially a better than no annual fee setup for extremely strong earning in certain categories. And flexibility of how this cash back can become miles and this miles getting you extreme value. When it comes to the Chase Sapphire Reserve, there's two other Chase cards which make up something known as a Chase Trifecta. You have the Chase Freedom Flex and the Chase Freedom Unlimited and together with all three of them, the coverage you get looks like the following. Given the same understanding that we can combine the points from these two other cards with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, that basically means we can have these points to be transferred to partners such as airlines and hotels, but also redeemed on that Chase travel portal where we're getting one and a half cents per point per each and every point redeemed on the portal. With the Freedom Flex, we're getting 5x points per dollar spent on certain categories which switch out each and every quarter. So whether that's home improvement stores, dining, gas stations, McDonald's, PayPal, etc. There are certain specific merchants as well as kind of specific categories as a whole. And with the Freedom Unlimited, we get one and a half x points per dollar spent when there's no like categorical spending and that's you know the minimum you'll get on each and every dollar one and a half percent back so going forward with the capital one duo you're always looking at 2x miles on that miscellaneous spend and with the chase sapphire reserve slash the chase trifecta as a whole you're looking at earning one and a half x chase points per each and every dollar spent whether it's a duo or the trifecta you'll notice that the annual fee burden that you have to take on Really, there's nothing there other than the annual fee you're paying for that premium travel card. This is mentioned perfectly because what's coming up with the Amex trifecta is some extreme earn rate, but there's definitely a second annual fee involved. The Amex Platinum has a $695 annual fee. There's also nuance between personal credit cards and business credit cards, and some folks just don't want to deal with that you know, black box as it feels. And I was there, but I can tell you, they're basically the same thing. There's really no difference at a very high level. And so given this, the Amex Platinum, it will give you 5X on flights, hotels, and 1X everywhere else. So we already know that the daily driver of that card isn't really there. And when we take the business card into account, there's a card known as the Amex Blue Business Plus. And with this card, we earn 2X points on everything. So similar to the Capital Adventure X, 2X everywhere, we get 2X Amex points everywhere, and this card has no annual fee. And the third is the Amex Gold card, where you're getting 4X on dining as well as groceries, which 4X is pretty crazy if you're spending in these categories. Yet the annual fee, it's $325, but also comes with a heavy amount of benefits, which they kind of remarket to you in the same way that Amex Platinum has such a high annual fee, but it has so much more in value. So after having these cards for multiple years, the answer I would say for which is the best card versus which one is the best card for me versus which is the best card for you. These three answers could be all just different. And so with that, let's get into it. If you're an individual, the Amex Platinum is going to be the way to go. The reason being, when you're flying Delta, another benefit which we just didn't mention is that you can access the Delta Sky Club. And that just means you're able to get in. But if you want a second person, you got to pay an extra amount. Similarly with the Amex Centurion Lounge. If you're alone, you can get into the Centurion Lounge for free. But if you want to bring another person, you have to spend $50. And the way to circumvent this is to spend $75,000 in a year. And if that's normal for you to do on the Amex Platinum, which maybe that's going towards flights and hotels, but maybe not that daily spend, then that's great. It's an extra benefit for you. But for the average person, maybe that's not. And so if you have a family in this mix, you'll really realize very quickly that the Amex Platinum is great for the individual. But if you want more than yourself getting into a lounge, the priority pass benefit that comes with it you can get for you know up to you and two others and that's very good but that's not an amex platinum specific benefit that comes with all of these cards so that's the biggest thing i would say is the amex platinum has a lot of personal values of your business travel or solo or you know in general that's just your lifestyle i think it's a great card for the individual the one caveat i will say is that the amex platinum although the daily earn rate kind of is subpar there's amex offers for a lot of luxury brands and more like more than the middle market, a little more upper middle class kind of brands. And so what that really means is there could be offers on there, which if you're spending anyways, you could actually come out ahead 
by just holding on to the Amex Platinum. And to contradict what I just said, there's other Amex cards that have many other offers that are very similar. It's just in my experience, I've noticed that the Platinum has the best offers, followed by let's say the Gold, the Green, and then a lot of these other membership reward earning cards, which maybe there's no annual fee or maybe a $95 one, and the offers do exist, they're just not as good as you get higher up in the Amex line of cards. And this holds true for co-brand cards, such as their Delta Airlines cards or Hilton cards. So in other words, these airline and hotel cards, any cards within the Amex program, basically they have Amex offers, generally speaking, and there's different ones between personal cards and business. So this is maybe a little too nuanced, but the point is, if you're a heavy spender, actually Amex could be the best option irrespective of, you know, considering the others as a whole. I used to be on the road as a management consultant, and I can tell you, the Amex Platinum was a lifesaver. Being based out of Atlanta, taking Delta flights to and from the client site, and then coming back, the point is the Delta Sky Club being available and accessible by yours truly, whether in Atlanta or outside, and just having a better lifestyle. So I think that's the key word, lifestyle. It's really more comfortable. You're just gonna have all the you know bells and the whistles, for lack of a better way to put it. So the Amex Platinum, just, I don't think there's any comparison. It, that is the answer. If you're an individual traveler, if you're actually traveling, now if you're just sitting at home or you're not traveling as much, then these other credits are going to be important. Your Walmart Pluses of the world, your $300 Equinox annual credit, right? So it's like understanding yourself, your situation, all those type of variables to get into this equation to solve what is the best outcome for you. The Chase Sapphire Reserve, honestly, is my favorite card. But that's because it has a special place in my heart because it was the first real premium travel card slash that card that opened my mind into what was really possible and what was out there in the world of points and miles. This is gonna be the best card for people that are really kind of more mathematical, more taking that game approach. In other words, hey, you can combine this card with this other card and then that third card. And there's this system, there's the chase trifecta and you know, this flexibility of points usage, that value of each point being one penny per point. So in other words, if you wanna accumulate upon a lot of points, if you know the partners make sense for you, that really is a big angle of choosing any of these cards, then hands down, it's gonna solve itself. And the example I would say is one of the best partners that they have is Hyatt. And Hyatt, you typically get two cents per point. So in other words, if you're looking at a $100 hotel room or 150 bucks, you can get that realistically for 3,500 points a night, 5,000 points a night. And if you're looking at really fancy properties or really great areas, whether you're in Japan or in New York, for example, you can get rates for maybe 30,000 points per night. Sounds like a lot but the value you're getting of like 600 bucks, thousand dollar worth of room, 1500 bucks worth of room, and multiple thousands just depending on the country, is phenomenal. Chase used to have Korean Air as a partner and they're no longer with them and it's been multiple years since. At the same time, they have Virgin Atlantic, which Virgin is a Sky Team partner. In other words, you can book Delta flights through Virgin's platform and vice versa. And so folks in that alliance, at least there's a way to find these type of flights. So it's not like, hey, this partner's not there, so I can't do it. There's all these other roundabout ways of getting exactly what you want. So on that note, with Amex, you have Delta as a partner, which you're not gonna have Delta with Chase, and vice versa. At the same time, there are different ways to book these flights, and they may not be the same price, but the optionality exists is really the important point that you shouldn't forget. Because when we come now to the capital of Venture X, an interesting thing is the partner list, when we come to hotels specifically, there's no Marriott, there's no Hilton, there's no IHD, there's no Hyatt. You're gonna get your Wyndham rewards, uh, you know, kind of properties and, and that's fine, right? But it's not giving you that bigger type of reach. So although the Capital and VentureX may seem like, hey, there's less burden up front. In other words, hey, they're paying you five bucks to keep it. With the Chase Sapphire Reserve, if you do nothing, you're paying 550 bucks minus a $300 credit, now you're paying 250 out of pocket. With Amex Platinum, if you take no advantage of many of the credits, you're gonna come out at a loss. But if you really have good use, then you can come really that much ahead, that much faster. All of that to say, big part with the Capital and Venture X is that if you're a family, the crazy thing is you have free authorized users, not just one or two, you're talking multiple. And so what this means is with Amex Platinum, if you want someone to have the same benefits as you know, what you're having basically, you would need to pay, you know, let's say 195 bucks in that range. And it gets a little cheaper as you're paying with other 
uh, for other authorized users. At the same time, this amount could increase over time. Maybe it's 250 per user. Maybe eventually 10 years on the line, it's 500 a user because the annual fee is $2,000, just an example. For the Chase Sapphire Reserve, each authorized user is $75. And so this is the way I provided priority pass access to my family members by spending 75 a year consistently for multiple years. But when the Capital One Venturex came out, you basically can give this access up to four authorized users. And with each priority pass, you, you're able to get in as well as two others. So if you do that math, that's like four people times three total you know, entries, that's 12 people, and then you have your own. So that's another three folks for free. So like 15 people, which is one card. So if you look at just that overall example, there's so much more value to be had with the Capital One Venture X if that's what you're trying to optimize for. Sitting here all day arguing one point of one card towards another, towards another, the day will never end and it will be next year before you know and all these cards are gonna refresh and change your benefits and all these things and annual fees will go up, right? So the point here is that if you came this far in the video, the guess, and before sharing my closing thoughts, I will say that there's important rules to know where when it comes to Chase, that intro bonus offer is going to be one time you can get it every 48 months. So you can't just like get the card, cancel, and like kind of repeat that cycle if that's what you were thinking of. At the same time, the Amex Platinum, it's once in a lifetime. So good luck. With Capital and Venture X, they run your credit with all three bureaus. So a lot of people, they're very well qualified, but they just can't get approved. But they get approved for these other two cards but they just can't get approved whether it's a Venturex or any other Capital One card. One more important part is with the Amex Platinum. If you get the Amex Platinum first and then the gold and the green, these other cards that seem below the Platinum, you're not gonna be able to get their bonuses. So it's like you're forced to get, hey, the lower rung tier cards and then build up to the Platinum. So just like something for your consideration if you're trying to look at the holistic value. So if you're an optimizer, there's gonna be an answer in terms of like pure money that you're getting back, probably Chase is the way to go because you have a lot of different ways to not spend a lot of money out of pocket, but when you're spending, you're basically earning back consistently, not just today, but whether you're an individual, there's less burden on your annual fees. If you have a family of four eventually, or pets or dogs or other like expenses, basically your annual fees are not gonna go up or systematically go up either, where with Amex, they do go up every few years, not just on one card, like multiple cards under their portfolio. With the Capital and Venture X, you know, it's the newest product out of these three, but it's also been around for you know almost three years, basically. So from that perspective, it's how is the game gonna change? Are they gonna refresh this, introduce new you know, earn rate multipliers? Are they gonna jack up the bonus at some point? You know, so it all depends how you wanna target it. If you want one card, don't wanna think about it, just spend on it, the Capital Venture X is gonna way to be, be the way to go. Two X miles on each and every dollar spent, no brainer, easy peasy. So in the end, if you're looking for benefits and travel and all of that, I would say Damage Platinum is the way to go. The Chase Sapphire Reserve, great for cash back or variability where hey, I'm in my traveling phase, or I have a player too, we're traveling together. Later you're like, man, I'm not gonna travel. I don't know what to do with this card that's so great for travel. Like the Amex Platinum, a lot of people get into this, not rut, but situation where they're like, okay, what do I do now? Do I cancel, do I keep, do I downgrade, and what happens? And with the Chase Sapphire Reserve, you can basically downgrade to no annual fee cards without any issues. That's a way to approach it in the longer term. But you could also just keep your Chase Sapphire Reserve, figure out if all those other kind of merchants like DoorDash or those equivalents like Lyft, if you're taking them in the city, depending just on your situation, then that could be the way to go too. With the Venture X, it's very straightforward. I look at it honestly like a no annual fee card where I'm like, okay, I don't even need to think about this. If you get approved for it, go, you know, keep it, enjoy it, keep on going on with your life, right? And the Capital One ecosystem though, it's not as strong as combining with all your like trifectas of the world. And over time, I think that's gonna change. So until then, we're gonna see what happens with everything Capital One. I have all three, I have no regrets. I'm happy to have them. It's obviously different when you're in my situation where I do take a lot of advantage of the benefits. I really like them individually and I get max value. If I could keep only one, it'd be the Amex Platinum. If I could only recommend one, it would be the Capital One Venture X. Because the Capital One Venture X, it's basically easy for beginners, intermediate, advanced people to kind of figure out and toy with and play with. While the Amex Platinum seems like, man, you really gotta travel to take advantage of it. And the Chase Sapphire Reserve over the years has become this middle child of like, okay, it was great when it first came out. It's still pretty nice. It's still okay. Is it really that good, right? These are the questions that are coming up. So in the end, those two really are the competitors, I would say. The Amex Platinum and the Capital One Venture X. Because the Chase Sapphire Reserve is great. Is it losing its shine? I would say most likely, yeah. But I have a full video where I go even deeper into it, where I share my 
personal experience with both the Amex Platinum and the Chase Alvarez Reserve, which I'll leave here. If you stuck this far, thank you for coming to the end. See you soon enough. Peace for now.